So uh, we start the final session of uh, the didactics, after which we will have live surgery transmission from Max Vaishali. So uh, may I invite our chairpersons for this session, David Chen, Todd Hennifert, David Ross. Can we walk to the stage? Because our keynote speaker has uh, decided to present from the front of the room. I think he feels bad for the people who have chosen to sit in the front. So there are many, many fantastic surgeons in this large room and I'm sure most of us realize that we still lack some things. We still need to do something more. And there is always that little something which gnaws at you and which keeps pulling you further and further. So one of the things that I think many of you will admit is while you may be mechanically perfect surgeon, or near perfect surgeons, you may not really be the thinking surgeon that you aspire to be. Now, to be a thinking surgeon is no small matter. It would take considerable investment in thinking into more than surgery. Surgery is one part of it. There is a whole huge life outside it. When you learn more about life, you become a thinking surgeon. Obviously, by that time, most of us are so old that there's nobody to listen to us. But fortunately, we have someone who is uniformly considered to be a giant in the field of GI surgery, who is based out of Medanta Medicity Hospital in Gurgaon and is well known to be a high volume complex GI surgery center and he has been inspirational in so many ways. He lets his work do the talking, but also forces you to think and question yourself. Without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Adarsh Chaudhary. My grandfather loved art, and my father and me knew nothing about art. It's so strange that diabetes, hypertension, Ballness is transmitted, but intelligence is not one. One day I was cleaning my grandfather's books, and this piece of paper came out of one of the books, which said, if you listen carefully enough to anything, it will talk to you. At that time, it appeared to me that it's a smart one-liner. I put it back into the book, and I forgot about it. In 2010, I went to... Italy and I also visited Vatican. Many of you know this painting, The School of Athens, painted by the famous Italian painter Rafal between years 1509 to 1511. An absolute work of genius. This fresco shows 21 Greek philosophers in one fresco. It has Aristotle, it has Plato, it has Diotrephes. Pythagoras, Euclid, and this fresco has come to symbolize the union of art, philosophy, and science. The tondo on it reads, Coserum Cognitio, which means the knowledge of wise. As I was standing in front of this painting, it happened. Our Upanishads say, that the Guru comes to you only when you are ready. You don't need a lifetime for a transformation. One word, one sentence, one movement, one incident, one relationship lost, one relationship gained. You are a changed person. And for me, that moment was a changing time when I started understanding and learning about art. And that day, the characters in this fresco started talking to me. I could see the colors come out alive, and that's when I started getting interested in art. 
Actually, if you see, nothing in the world has a meaning. We attach meaning to things. I'm a surgeon at heart and everything I see, I relate to surgery. There's a word in organizational learning which is called as associative fluency. What it means is the ability to make connections when you are confronted with an object, a thought or an idea. My talk today is a living example of associative fluency because those seven paintings I'm going to present to you, to my mind they reflect some essential tenets of surgical philosophy which my teachers taught to me or I learned over time. I'm often asked the question that, can studying art make you a better surgeon? At least it's made me a better surgeon ever since I developed some visual literacy. I can see things better than others. I see CT scans better. I see missing patterns in my patients. And there are a lot of books about it which talk about how studying art can make not only better surgeons, better marines, better forensic scientists, better astronauts and if you do not believe me let's play a game today i'm going to show you these seven paintings please concentrate on these paintings and see how much you miss that's when you will realize what visual literacy means so let's start the tour of these paintings if you ever go to london and go to the national gallery of art the best paintings are in room number 34 you have famous paintings there, like a painting which is regarded as the best painting in British history called the Fighting Tamir. You have Haven and you have Whistle Jacket. But the painting which attracts maximum number of people is a painting called An Experiment on a Bird in the Air Pump. This painting was made by an artist called Joseph Wright, who lived in Derby and now popularly known as Joseph Wright of Derby. Look at this painting. It's a living drama of a scientific experiment. There's a scientist, there's an air pump, and there's a bird in the air pump. What the scientist is demonstrating the value of air. Once the oxygen is removed, the air goes into fluttering, the bird, and when he puts the air back, the bird starts breathing. What is interesting to observe is the reaction of the onlookers. See the fear in children, the absorbed person, the intensity of these two people, and this is a couple which is least interested in the whole thing, they are busy in themselves. That's exactly what happens in surgical meetings today. There are some people who are scared, some people are interested, and some people are totally indifferent. Notice something else also. See, there's a full moon there. Many of you would have missed I'll tell you the importance of this full moon. Also notice that the entire painting is lit by a single candle. It might be the light of revolution and in artistic circle it is called as a chiaroscuro effect. What it means is that the artist uses light and shade to create a contrast to give a three-dimensional image. Darby in those days was the center of intellectual activity. And a group of scientists who were interested in science, philosophy, electricity, mathematics used to meet there regularly in this house and they used to meet on the full moon. That's why it was called the Lunar Society. That's why John Wright put the moon in that painting. The scientists included uh, Joshua Wedgwood, Dr. Erasmus Darwin, who was the grandfather of Charles Darwin, uh, Joseph Presley, the guy who discovered oxygen, Alan Watts, John Alan Watts, who discovered the steam engine. So all these people used to sit together and talk. John Wright was not a scientist, but he was a friend. He used to observe their discussions and he writes in his book that the biggest thing these people had, a sense of curiosity. Actually, if you see what drives science, what drives research, what drives philosophical insight is curiosity. Curiosity is of two kinds. One is perceptual curiosity which is caused by novelty like many of you are curious that what will be my talk today so it's short-lived my talk is over your curiosity is over but what scientists researchers do what is called as 
epistemic curiosity which means the desire for knowledge and trust me curiosity is a very big driving force for research this is a very interesting book written by a comedian where he has shown that intellectual curiosity is the best way to have incremental learning i don't know many of who how many of you know the canadian american skeptic john randy who said a very beautiful thing that no amount of belief makes something a fact and this painting shows that science has no role for subjectivity what is important is objectivity in science we need experiments we need data that's how facts emerge in science the second painting is called the card shops it is made by the famous italian painter caravaggio who himself was an interesting character i can't tell you about him because time is short and this painting is called the card shops now notice this painting carefully what is happening is this is this boy rich man definitely is unworldly is not smart he is playing card with another boy who is so smart a red feather always means clever thing in european art so they are playing cards now notice how this boy has hidden some cards in his belt there is also a dagger with him there's an older accomplice who's looking over the shoulder of this boy and signaling to him look at the intricate details of the artist you can see the gloved finger there are something is missing look at the anxious expression on this boy the young man is obviously being duped if there is one game which mimics surgery it's poker because in poker you have incomplete information many things are hidden you have to take decisions under uncertainty just like you have to do in surgery in surgery you don't know everything many of us as surgeons do not understand the difference between uncertainty and risk when i do a pancreatic anastomosis i know there is 10% risk of a clinically relevant pancreatic fistula but i'm uncertain in which patient is going to happen so as surgeons we need to understand the risks can be measured that's why they can be predicted that's why management is possibly possible whereas uncertainty you cannot measure you cannot prevent so that's why whenever you make a surgical plan always incorporate uncertainty into your plans why are things un uncertainty exists rene magritte was a famous belgian painter he made this painting of a pipe and wrote this is not a pipe he was asked in an interview what is this paradox you made a painting of a pipe and you share this is not a pipe he said this is a picture of a pipe and then he said something very profound for surgeons he said when you see something there is lot which is not seen and in life you need to differentiate between visible obvious and visible hidden i give you an example of visible hidden for years we knew that our gut has multiple bacteria multiple fungi multiple viruses we never attached importance to it we are now realizing that the gut microbiome is an organ in itself it's possibly a driver for anastomotic leaks it potentiates development of cancer it is responsible for immunomodulation who knows gut bacteria may be responsible for the failures of mesh to take place for seromas to develop so that's why there is uncertainty because there are many things we do not understand and surgeons who fall victim to the seductions of certainty pay the price for that the third painting i have selected is called the raft of medusa this painting i have selected for two reasons for the painter and the painting the raft of medusa possibly is the second most popular painting in the world next to mona lisa This painting was made by Theodor Duco who was an embodiment of a tortured genius all his life. Those of you who have seen this painting in the Louvre shows some abandoned men on a makeshift raft. If you see this painting the characters are virtually falling out of the canvas. The artist has put this lower end of the raft at the lower end of the picture so when you go to the loop you feel you can step on the raft and you are an active participant 
in this painting rather than a mute spectator. The story behind this painting is quite pathetic. In 1816, the French ship Medusa sailed from France to the colony in West Africa of Senegal. On the way, there was some problem. The ship had to be abandoned. There were less lifeboats. So the rich and the famous got onto the lifeboats. The slaves and the servants were asked to be on a makeshift raft, which was tied to this lifeboat by a rope, and they were on the sea. Very soon, people realized that the raft was slowing down the speed of the boat, so it cut that rope. 147 men were stranded in the sea for 13 days, and only 15 of them survived. That became a national embarrassment and disaster in France. And Theodore Duco, who was an artist, was so affected by it that he decided to make a painting. He became so obsessed with this, he started visiting various hospitals and mortuaries to study dead bodies, to study the color of putrefying flesh. He even brought a decapitated head from a lunatic asylum, put in top of his studio, and every day used to see the change in color. He wanted his painting to be absolutely accurate. Two years he shut himself in his studio and did the painting. And one of my favorite authors, Robert Pirsig, many of you would have read this book, said something so beautiful that you want to make a great painting, it's easy. Make yourself perfect and paint naturally. That's what's for true surgeons also. I've rarely seen a person who's a shabby human being and is a good surgeon. Excellence doesn't come in parts. Excellence is a habit. It comes down in everything. And also, this painting has a very important message. Actually, this is not a painting. It is a manifesto. If you see the apex of this painting, there's a black man waving. This black man was a man called as John Charles. He was both a savior and a survivor. For the first time in the history of Europe, a black man was shown to be a hero. This was not taken well by authorities in France and the art circles. And this painting remained unrecognized, unsold, till Theodore Buco died, frustrated, painless man at the age of 34. Only after he died, this painting became famous. So what is the message of this painting? The message of the painting is, apart from being obsession for details, many times in life, what is right and what is easier to different things. Theodore Gukko could have painted some rich man, got money, but he didn't do that. He painted what is right. So what is right and what is easy may be different. My field of interest is pancreatic surgery. When I do a pancreatic resection, I know most of the recurrences occur dorsal to the portal vein. I spent 45 minutes to one hour working in this field because I think I am an important prognostic factor in this patient's life. I've seen people do surgery in workshops, they just take away the unsinate process. It is right. It, it's, it's easy, but it's not right. I believe being right is more important than what is being doing easy. The fourth painting is a very interesting painting. I want your concentration on this painting. This painting is called The Conjurer. It is made by the Dutch artist Hieronymus Bosch, who was not only a painter, but a very good scholar of art. Look at this painting. The central character in this painting is leaning forwards. He is looking at this gem in the hand of this conjurer. There are three animals in this painting. All three of them in Dutch folklore have a negative connotation. There is a frog here, which is a sign of stupidity. There is a dog here, which is a sign of greediness. And there is a small owl there. Owl in Dutch folklore means lies. So what is happening in this painting is this man is observing this. Now, how many of you observed something else in this painting? Somebody is stealing the purse of this man. And a child is laughing at him. There's a Flemish proverb which says, if you don't pay attention, you lose your money and children will laugh at it. And that's what happens in real life when you don't have attention. Those of you who haven't read this book, which was published in 2010, called The Invisible Gorilla at Surgeons, you must read it. Because this book highlights the phenomenon of inattentional blindness. What it means is, you think you are concentrating on something, and at the same time, you are missing something very important and obvious. You miss it because you are concentrating on that. 
as surgeons, we need to develop a panoramic awareness as to what is happening around us. The tunnel vision is a fact. It happens. Many of us have this illusion of attention. But you have to realize that the tragedy is not because we have inattention blindness. The tragedy is we don't even realize that we have inattention blindness. Remember, sight is a faculty. Seeing is an art. And we as surgeons have to develop this art. This patient was referred to our department following a cholecystectomy. The bile duct was injured. So I talked to the operating surgeon as to what had gone wrong. He said something very stupid but very interesting. He said, sir, I looked but failed to see. What a beautiful thing to say. Looked but failed to see. This is a living example of inattention blindness. Apollo Robbins is an interesting man. He is a slate of hand artist. You talk to him for two, three minutes. He's sitting next to you. He goes. He's taken away your purse. He's taken away your watch. You won't even know what has happened. He calls himself a gentleman thief. When he was asked, how does he do that? He said, it's all about the choreography of a man's attention. An occupied mind is missing the present. That's the message. How we get deceived. Our mind is somewhere else. And we think we are looking somewhere else. The fifth painting is a very simple painting by Samuel von Hochstraten, who was also a Dutch painter. It shows an old man in a window. Look at the old man's eyes. He's missing something. He's lost something in his life. Look at the wrinkles on his forehead. Look at the graying in his beard. This man is separated from the world by stone, wood, and iron. Look at the beauty of this stone the artist has made. It looks like hard stone. You feel if you touch it, it will feel like hard stone. Many of us are the same. We are caged. Cages are more often made of thoughts that of than iron. The worst liars in life are our own beliefs. We are caught in our own beliefs. And now my question to the audience. How many of you notice this small vase lying here? This small leaf lying here? The artist, you noticed it? You are a liar. Maybe you are right. Okay. But I thought it would be missed. Anyway. So why has this artist put? Because this vase gives you a depth of perception. A perception of depth. The painting looks big and also I believe the magic potion lies in this small vase. How can we come out of the prison? How can we do that? We as surgeons suffer from confirmation voice. We always seek, interpret, research, filter information that suits our beliefs. There are people who still believe that IPOM works for everything. They are not willing to accept that the science has changed. We have better procedures, but then they still persist with it and they look for evidence supporting their beliefs. Those of who, you who want to be perfect, there are five criteria of excellence today. The acronym is OCEAN. But forget about taking a picture, just get the first thing right, what is called as openness to experience. What it means is active, open minded thinking. I want you to read this paper, which tells us on a scoring system, what is your cognitive flexibility, how dogmatic you are, what is your belief perseverance, if you are willing to entertain other people's opinions, a multitude of advice is given to you, that's only you can be creative and get better at your abstract thinking. The next painting is one of my favorite paintings. It's made by a Polish artist, John Mateczko. And this painting was made in the height of Polish demonstration in 1862. It appears a very simple painting. But a lot is happening in this painting. Stan Sysik is an important character in Polish history. He lived around 1500 years at that time. He was a man of 
very sharp wit, deep intellect, and very highly respected for his insightful analysis. In this picture, he is sitting slumped in the chair. You can see he is in emotional turmoil. Observe the wrinkling on the carpet. He is actually slumped into the chair in despair. He is frustrated. The caduceus which is for jesters holding his hand is thrown out. He has read something in these papers which make him socially isolated. He is frustrated and if you see in the background there is a party going on. The royalty is not interested. There is a ball going on. They are eating and drinking. And now the observation check. How many of you have seen this window? Can you see there is a cathedral and there is a comet falling. In 1533 a comet did fall on Warsaw. And in mythology comets are bad omens. Whenever there is a comet it is believed there is disaster, there is war, there is famine. So Stan Sisek is frustrated. Something is going amiss. There is a word which the US Marines are taught is called situational awareness. Whenever you are in a situation, you need to know where you are, where you are going, what is, what is called as recalibrating reality. Every day you see a patient and new things happen. But unfortunately, many of us as surgeons perpetually replace the unconditional, the uncomfortable reality with the soothing fiction of our explanations. We don't self over here, things are going wrong. We still don't understand. You do a mesh repair of a patient and that's what happens. You better get scared. You better get scared because you put a mesh, there's a leak, something is amiss. The problem with us is that we are somehow hardwired for optimism. Optimism is good when you watch a soccer match or a cricket match. But as surgeons, if you try to predict your thoughts and beliefs into reality, that doesn't help our patients. It is very important that a patient like this is eventually going to need a bowel resection. The earlier you uh, uh, understand it, the better it is. When I was young, I used to read a lot of comics and I cannot forget this scene that these two agents are standing and are surrounded by a group of Russian men holding machine guns. So this guy asked him, are you scared? He said, I'm always worried about people who are not scared when they ought to be. And if you have a problem in a patient, you need to be scared. As surgeons, we need to have a kaleidoscope of emotions. Uh, we, we need to have confidence. We need to have frustration. We need to have confusion. Because ultimately, what matters to us is patient's life. A simple rule in our department is a secret code called 50-50-90. I have scribbled it in my office. What it means is, when you have a 50% chance of things going wrong, there's a 90% chance they will go wrong. So we are mentally prepared for it. So that's what we need to understand. This is the last painting. The painting is called The Chess Players. It is made by the German artist Maurice Augustus Retsch. This painting shows the devil is playing chess with a young boy. This is the guardian angel. Look at the stern expression on devil's face. He has his green cap, the red feather, sign of arrogance, sign of deceit. Look at his throne. There's a lion sitting there. There's a human skull. And this man is obviously losing. There are more white pieces than black pieces. Now, your check. How many of you notice that there's a spider here? The spider is gradually moving towards that boy, casting its web to ensnare this boy. The boy is losing the game. He's losing his life. Now I'm going to tell you two stories linked with this painting. Paul Morphy was a famous player of chess in America. He went for dinner to somebody's house and there he saw this painting. And he looked at the game and he said, I think the boy can still win. They said, no, it's not possible. So they said, let's put the game here. So they put the board. There were the chess players also. So Paul Morphy won that game. So all is not lost. Paul Morphy proved that all is not lost. What everything, what everybody said, the game is over, is not true. 
I had this patient of colonic cancer. He had multiple liver metastasis. He came to me very frustrated, very depressed. He had enough reasons. So I gave him a lot of hope. And incidentally, this photograph was in my phone. So I told him this story. That we must not give up. We must try. It's possible. So we gave this. We did a colectomy on him. We gave him chemotherapy. His tumors regressed. We did a hepatic resection on him. And four years later, he came to me doing well. He said, Doc, give me the keys to your car. I said, why? He said, I give you something. I said, what is that? He said, it's too big. I better need the keys to your car. So he got the painting made for me. And this is the painting in my drawing room, which is there. He gave me this painting. But notice something in this painting. There is no spider in this painting. So I said, where is the spider? Your artist forgot the spider. He said, no. This is my thought process. I think my war is on with the devil, but I am not going to be ensnared. I am going to survive. I will keep finding the bet B, fighting the battle. So the lesson for we as surgeons is a hernia may be very big, a tumor may be very big. We don't have to get defeated. We should try it because the profound sentences, definitions belong to the definers and not the defined. For somebody, a tumor may be indestructible. For somebody, the hernia may be doable, but with such meetings, such conferences, such knowledge, such wisdom, I think we can help our patients. This is my last slide. I'm on time. I believe art is the conscience of a society. It's a barometer of our culture. Ali Broad, who is a philanthropist from America, said, civilizations are not remembered by their business people, bankers or lawyers. They are remembered by their arts. And later I have added, possibly by hernia surgeons also. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity.